Hello, and welcome back to Helsinki on the Hill, a series of conversations hosted by the United States Helsinki Commission on Human Rights and Comprehensive Security in Europe and Beyond. I'm your host, Alex Tierski. Listeners, we are recording this episode in what may be the final months of a global pandemic. For more than a year, COVID-19's disruptive effects have been felt far and wide, and that includes unprecedented cancellations and postponements of major public events all over the world. But the highest profile confab on the global calendar looks, at least as of now, to be on for this summer, the Tokyo Olympics. They're slated to take place in late July after a one-year postponement. Now, there's no doubt that the media and the public will be focused on how COVID might impact the spectacle of the games, and for good reason. But there's another story here that has the potential to make these Olympics truly different from any in the modern era. Listeners, these will be the first games to take place after the passage by the United States Congress of the Rochenkov Anti-Doping Act, a groundbreaking law with potentially transformative consequences for the anti-doping fight in international competition. On today's episode, we will explore how the Rochenkov Anti-Doping Act came to be and how it might impact doping in sports, including the summer's Olympic games. And we have an extraordinary guest interview to share with you. Joining us for the podcast is Dr. Gregory Rochenkov himself, the man this bill was named after. Now, those of you who are familiar with this story, perhaps you've seen the award-winning documentary film Icarus, know that Dr. Rochenkov is the former head of the Russian anti-doping lab who blew the whistle on his former government's manipulation of athletic competition. Since he came forward with detailed accusations against all levels of the Russian government and its sports machine, he has been in great fear of his life. In fact, for the last several years, Dr. Rochenkov has been in hiding in the United States, and the news media has carried credible reports that Russian officials posted here have been expelled for pursuing him. Dr. Rochenkov, of course, called in for this interview on a secure line from an undisclosed location. Before we get to our interview, I do want to thank the Helsinki Commission's anti-corruption advisor, Paul Massaro, whose voice you'll also hear, for helping make this conversation happen. Paul has been at the center of the bill's consideration and passage from its inception. Dr. Rochenkov, thank you very much for joining us on Helsinki on the Hill. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you. Your story, sir, is is well known to many of our listeners, but if you'd permit, I'd like to remind our audience of the facts of your case. As detailed in the award-winning book that you released last year, The Rochenkov Affair, you are the former director of Russia's anti-doping laboratory, which was suspended by the World Anti-Doping Agency in 2015 for facilitating Russia's elaborate state-sponsored doping program. You helped develop and distribute banned substances, banned performance enhancers, to thousands of Russian sports stars from 2005 from to 2015, and you made headlines in 2016 as a whistleblower, exposing the extensive nature of Russia's doping program, leading to bans on Russia's participation in, in international competition in the Olympics. You are currently in witness protection in the United States. Let me start, Dr. Rochenkov, by asking you, it's been now some five years since you exiled yourself from Russia and entered witness protection here in the United States. Do you still feel threatened, sir? Oh, uh, yes. I feel threatened, but it doesn't mean that I am in the in fears because you cannot be in the fears for many years, only maybe several days. But the most important for me, we are keeping uh, strict safety measures and uh, it's a part of my life, my daily routine. That's it. I understand, but clearly you, you, the reports are that you are, you are still under threat. Could you help our listeners understand why the Russian government would wish you harm? Oh, it's a quite typical story because Russian government, and uh, I would prefer Kremlin government, they are doing things which are opposite to interest of Russia as a nation of countries. So don't mix up Russia and Kremlin covering group. This is important. And Kremlin took not the worst, but the main things from Soviet Union. And Soviet Union during uh, Soviet times, uh, it was a between, uh, it was a competition between West and East. They considered sport as a political affair, as a facade, as a demonstration that uh, communist and socialist countries have advantage and uh, superiority over the West. 
and it remains now. So it was absolutely not good picture when country losing position in economy, but trying to upheld sport, which also degraded in course of economy degradation. But the only way is to upheld this decline uh, is doping. And doping was integral part of Russia, Russian sport. And then it was important, very important in Putin's eyes. And then under Putin's regime, if you are not cooperating with regime, you are enemy. And this, you, you have to understand the situation. You have no choice. When I was a director, and in my hands, it was a nice instrumentation, fantastic researchers, and I was responsible for their lives and careers. I cannot say what we are doing. And Putin, consider people who are telling truth from inside, like informant or whistleblowers, as a pure traitors. And those traitors, betrayers, should be simply in a straightforward way killed. You know how, how dramatic things were exposed. There are groups of people who are killing not people abroad, like Skripals or Litvinenko, but people inside Russia. I was lucky. When turbulence began, thanks to whistleblower Stepanovs, I retired from my job. I was immediately notified from all important people. Get lost, escape. And it saved my life. Dr. Rochenkov, it, clearly you, you knew much of this about how the Kremlin regime would consider an enemy, as you have described it, someone who is not who is part of the system and then chooses not to be a part of the system. Can you tell our listeners a bit about how you made the decision to turn against this Kremlin system of sports doping, which you led for so long? And I, I, I would like to ask you, sir, it's a difficult question, but are you satisfied today that it was the right decision for you to make? Good question. When I was director, I do understand that we are saying that we are following other rules. Meantime, we were cheating the whole sport world. But it allowed me to have scientific research to head to run laboratory of dream. My laboratory was one of the best of the best in the world. Sochi lab is unrivaled forever. And three turning points in my life. First of all, it was turbulence started from Stepanov's revelations. They shed light into athletics problem in Russia. I retired. Then I was told again, get lost. Thanks to Brian Fogel and the documentary producers of the Icarus film, I emerged in Los Angeles and I continued working on documentary. But still I worry because I kept in my head secrets. I had the only overall picture. Some people have like uh, some episodes uh, like a uh, pieces of puzzle, but the whole picture was inside my mind, and I felt, how to say, mystically threatened. Everything could happen, a car accident or heart attack, you never know. And it happened, not with me. My friend since school years, Nikita Kamaev, was killed. I was talking to him last day, so I was crying for one week, and then I immediately decided to go public. This is uh, was absolutely inevitable, and I am not regretting. And before Stepanov's and Nikita's death and my escape, it was, I'm honest with you, my very bad feelings during Sochi Games. It was opening ceremony, closing ceremony, and during Russian athletes were in the center of the huge stadium in Sochi, and during the same midnight, I was swapping the dirty urine. It's unimaginable. I didn't know what to do, but in my mind, it was absolutely clear decision. It cannot be like this. It cannot be left uh, under the carpet. One day I speak up. Thank you, Dr. Rachenkov. As I mentioned in the introduction, the United States late last year passed what is known as the Rachenkov Anti-Doping Act. And I'd like to bring in my colleague, Paul Massaro, who's the Helsinki Commission's anti-corruption expert, to talk about that act what it is, how we got here. Paul, thanks for coming on Helsinki on the Hill. Such a pleasure to be here, Alex. Great to have you, Paul. Can you take our listeners through this story? How did we get from the extraordinary act of courage that we just heard about from Dr. Rochenkov to a law in his name? Maybe you could start by talking about how some of the members of the Helsinki Commission became interested in this issue in the first place. 
Yeah, for sure. And and I want to start off just by saying how good it is to be here again with my friend, Dr. Rodchenkov. We have, in fact, met in person, uh, and I hope we'll meet in person again sometime, perhaps when COVID ends and perhaps when uh, he doesn't face such immediate persecution. Our story begins with Dr. Rodchenkov's representatives, and they wanted to offer Congress the opportunity to learn about Russia's weaponization of corruption in this case and the criminality in sport uh, that had gone on to advance Russia's foreign policy goals. And that's really important to emphasize. This is a classic case of authoritarian regimes using sport uh, for foreign policy. And I'll make this offer of, of learning from Dr. Rodchenkov's really singular firsthand experience here. So we actually were able to bring Dr. Rodchenkov in in person uh, to meet with our commissioners. And that's kind of where the real genesis of all of this begins. And it was this extremely emotional meeting. Uh, Dr. Rodchenkov told us his his story that he sort of just told you, and he had to wear a mask for fear of Russian retaliation, and we had security, and of course, uh, the help of the Capitol Police as well. And they didn't come to us saying, you know, you got to pass a law or anything like that. Really, they just wanted to tell his story and figure out how we could work together uh, to find some tangible solutions to this, which, you know, I mean, Russia's behavior here not only defrauded all these athletes, but defrauded the United States. And, and, and in all honesty, it threatens our national security. I mean, this, is, this sort of thing is just the classic weaponization of corruption tactics. So we needed to do something to create deterrence against those who persecute whistleblowers and defraud the United States in this way. Uh, and what happened to Dr. Rochenkov shouldn't happen to anybody else. The Foreign Corrupt Practices Act makes it illegal for a U.S. company or listed entity, anybody listed on our stock exchange, uh, to pay a bribe abroad. And it is one of the most powerful, meaningful laws ever passed by the United States. And it really is the USA complying with its own values. It's a commitment to never allow our economy to export corruption. Similarly, the Rochenkov Act is a commitment to never allow our economy to enable doping fraud. I mean, fundamentally, when we're thinking about these extraterritorial laws, really what it's all about is we want to ensure the United States is never inadvertently complicit in corruption. I mean, we've now seen so many Russian dissidents assassinated because of their whistleblowing. I mean, it's just such an extraordinary thing. And it's really important to note that in this particular case, we would know of none of this, none of it, if not for Dr. Rodchenkov. Representatives Jackson Lee and Burgess, who, who, who really believed in this, dropped the bill uh, and made it a reality. And, and from there, I mean, we just sort of ran with it, had a hearing, uh, got a Senate introduction, and then the real work began. Then the two years of coalition building and fending off all of these uh, opposing interests and all that kind of stuff. Thanks, Paul. That's that's fascinating backstory. Uh, Dr. Rochenkov, I imagine you, you remember this meeting with members of Congress in the, in the ornate halls of the United States Congress. I wonder if, if you can give us your recollection of, of uh, the, the meeting with our, our members of Congress. Oh, it was an uh, exciting meeting for me. We were uh, driving a long time to Washington, and I was received very well. People were, how to say, highly excited, you know, uh, and uh, I felt such uh, good feelings from, uh, and cordial reception, especially from uh, Shayla Jackson Lee. She was absolutely kind, and also Michael Burgess, he was, he, he, how to say, overwhelmed what I was saying, and then, again, Paul, you were there. Look, why Rochenkov Act was inevitable, because sport, corruption, and crime, they have cross-link relations. And if you take a helicopter view, what do we have in sport? You have three, four issues. It's a betting, gambling, sexism, and doping. In the first two issues, there are criminal laws and criminal things. So it was absolutely inevitable to bring criminal uh, law enforcement into sport, nothing new. Now I'm saying uh, just uh, not such much optimistic, but realistic thing. You know how long time it takes sexism in uh, gymnastic or uh, gambling and corruption in the football. It's unbelievable. We have to have understand that sports are not homogeneous. And when I'm talking about doping, I'm talking about those sports which were in front of my very eyes. It was, first of all, weightlifting, uh, athletics, track and field, biathlon, and some other sports. Absolutely full of doping. On the other hand, we have, let's say, archery or gymnastics or alpine skiing, which is absolutely another story. But if you go to the depths of doping, it's a, some sort like a cancer. 
And this cancer tumor was developed for years, for decades, and it has uh, metastasis in the different countries, national and dominant organization, national region. There is no remedy, no tool, no cannon or rifle to kill everything at, at once. So if you yes. see immediate remedy, you should understand that this is huge underwater war. And but you see nothing on the surface. It will resurface one day. Just wait. Dr. Ochenkov, thank you for that. What I'd like to do now is bring Paul back in to tell our listeners exactly what is the Rochenkov Anti-Doping Act, how has it changed the conversation around doping, and what tools, what new tools has it created to um, get at this cancer that Dr. Rochenkov is alluding to? We really are against uh, a lot of authoritarian states that are that are really active in this space, and it's about time we got active, and the Rochenkov Anti-Doping Act is going to enable us to do that in a, in a big way. And I think that's why it's one of the most important anti-corruption laws ever passed by Congress. It's a very rare one that has extraterritorial jurisdiction, first of all. So let me let me start by saying that one of the first and most important things that the Rochenko effect does is actually conceptual. It redefines doping as fraud. For a very, very, very long time, uh, doping has been understood to be performance-enhancing drugs, drug trafficking and that sort of thing, people taking drugs in locker rooms and, and whatever else. What this does is actually look at it from the money direction. When you defraud an athlete or a corporation or a state or whatever, there's prize money at stake. There's sponsorships. There's all sorts of other money that goes into sport. I mean, broadcasting rights, a huge industry. So when you use doping uh, to, to win a competition, you are denying someone a victory. You're denying them their rightful uh, uh, cash and, their, and really their rightful glory and their rightful lifetime achievement as well, which, which is much, much, much more difficult to put a price on, of course. So... Now, practically, it criminalizes doping fraud in international competitions. It does not criminalize athlete conduct. Very critically, this law is about going after the structural elements. There is a large system in place that up until now has basically only ever gone after the athlete. It has disqualified athletes uh, and, and all of the structural guys, the coaches, the administrators, the really some, sometimes transnational criminals, um, oftentimes transnational criminals, government officials, and so on and so forth, just get off scot-free and move them around. There's there's literally no way to go after them, and now there is. So this 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 really fills that loophole in a very serious way. Um, so with regard to the extraterritorial jurisdiction, it hits any any competition that touches the U.S. economy, basically. I mean, if you're if if there's a broadcast in the United States, or the sponsoring entity does business in the United States, or whatever then it is fair game. And that is really, really critical. Now, it also protects whistleblowers. And this is a really, really, really critical thing uh, you know, because part of the whole impetus of this, with a, you know, we called it the Rochenkov Anadomi Act because of Dr. Rochenkov's incredible bravery here. And so that we can protect whistleblowers in the future. Now, the DOJ under Title 18, our sort of criminal section, we have all of this law about protecting informants and witnesses, tons of it. But if, it, if it's not a crime, if you're not informing to a crime, none of it applies. So just by virtue of criminalizing this, we have brought all of these whistleblowers in understanding informant and witness protection laws, which is just huge. Now, finally, I want to talk about the restitution section of the bill, which is if we if we're able to get you in front of a court and convict you and find, you know, I don't know, you defrauded all these athletes of, of $10 million or $100 million or whatever it is in these corporations, there is mandatory restitution so that we actually make these athletes whole for the money that they've been denied. And, and I want to just say right here, um, the athletes are the victims of these crimes. They are the primary victims. And it is both sides of this game. It is it is the American athletes, the, the clean athletes who are denied and defrauded. But then also, in you know, Dr. Rochenko was talking about in, in Russia, if you don't dope, you don't compete, right? So in that particular case, you're being doped from the time you're a child. We had Yulia Stepanova, who, who Dr. Rochenkov also talked about at our hearing, and she talked about how they would give you, uh, you know, these drugs starting when you're like 13 or, or 14 or anything like that, and it would destroy your body. They call them vitamins, is what she said, you know? We want to keep the athlete in mind throughout all this, the rights of clean athletes, of course, uh, but also just human rights. Paul, thanks for that. It, it seems to me, just on the face of it, that providing additional tools to address the challenge of international sports doping would be something that would be universally popular 
and would immediately gain the support of anti-doping authorities uh, the world over. You alluded that this might not have been the case when you were working through the process of, of getting it passed into law. Can you talk a little bit about some of the opposition to the bill uh, and, and where it came from and, and, and how it was uh, addressed? For sure. And, and let, me, let me preface this by saying, you know, we built a, a really, really extraordinary coalition here supporting this. We had the major leagues on board. We had every Olympic national governing body. That means like USA Swimming and USA Track and Field, the US Olympic Committee, the US Anti-Doping Agency, every single athlete, everyone was supportive of this. But for some reason, the World Anti-Doping Agency, which is half intergovernmental and half totally funded by the IOC and really is not independent, they did not support this. In fact, they 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 engaged in a very, very, very uh, sort of <laughs> unfriendly lobbying campaign uh, to go against this. And in fact, the International Olympic Committee did the same thing. They, they were involved in this. And of course, the Kremlin made a large number of statements. At the end of the day, they met with everyone. They, they had their say. At the beginning, we met with them. We talked with them. We tried to really work with them as like a, a sincere partner on this. Uh, but then they started on with some really uh, sort of uh, unwelcome disinformation tactics, uh, saying things about the bill that were, you know, sort of overtly untrue. Like, for example, that it would apply to athletes, that, that, that you know, the, the United States is trying to bring all athletes under its jurisdiction or whatever, which, you know, as I said, there's a specific, specific exemption for athletes in the bill. But you sort of the list goes on. They had this Swiss attorney write up a whole uh, account of, of how it would screw up the whole international sports structure. I mean, it's, it, it really is kind of an extraordinary effort that they went to. And at the end of the day, it was a unanimous vote in both the House and the Senate to pass this thing. And that was signed by the president. Not a single member of Congress uh, bought what they were selling. And that is that is really, really, really credit to our incredible Congress and our bosses and our members of Congress that saw through uh, what, what really was an unwelcome campaign and one where you kind of got to wonder what the real motivations there were. Dr. Rochenkov, let me bring, bring you back into the conversation here. I'm curious if you could tell us how the Kremlin reacted to the, to the passage of the Rochenkov Anti-Doping Act. Forget about Kremlin, really. In the whole picture, there are hidden mechanisms which people don't know. That's why we still blows are of the paramount activity for the future fight against doping, unless uh, Department of Justice in the United States prepare top-level investigators who could speak the same language to doping frauds, athletes, and heads of federation. This should be understood. That's why whistleblowers should be upheld, welcome. And let me take a few minutes to tell the most important thing which I have now in my mind. I call this Yevgeny Kudryavtsev dilemma. Yevgeny Kudryatsev was head of my department of sample storage in Moscow. Because he was in Moscow, he had no choice. And he was key witness, key witness in the hearings in court arbitrage, sportive, so-called CAS. And I see the whole sport generation of 2014 lost case about Sochi Pro. They continued cheating, Kremlin, lying and denying. And Kudryavsev was again in the epicenter of the LIMS laboratory information system. Incredible falsification. 20,000 files falsified, deleted, whatever, uh, manipulated. 150 cheats saved. Do you think Kudryavsev is happy? He cannot move from Raga standpoint. He is of huge caliber cheat, criminal, unbelievable. But there is a small border between Russia and the United States to make him under rather top level in the history the same caliber as me and Stepanov Bistel Blow. You have to remember this and bring it to public to grasp the dilemma. The same like Rochenkov Law and Malinsky Law. Dr. Rochenkov, that was very helpful. Yeah, Paul, please. That's such an important point from Dr. Rochenkov. And I, I want to tell to this gentleman, you know, g give the DOJ a ring. You know, you're, you're, you would be under witness protections now, and they would love to hear from you. I was on a Hudson Institute event uh, a few weeks ago where we had the head, the FBI's head of the Sport Integrity Unit, and he, he called this law a huge hammer that they're going to use to go after kleptocrats, corrupt officials, and criminal figures in, in, in sport. And I'll tell you, every indication of the FBI and DOJ wants to enforce this aggressively, 
very, very aggressively. And they do need whistleblowers. It's not just in sport. I see this all over my portfolio. The only way investigations into kleptocracy, into sport corruption, into whatever are ever really made is via whistleblowers. So, so, so they really should step forward. I also want to just note real quick that, you know, oftentimes athletes are the first on the ground and, and do get this kind of information. And when that is the case, you know, again, athlete conduct is not criminalized under this, but there's a very, 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 very strong whistleblowing part, uh, uh, program with the U.S. Anti-Doping Agency that is already in place. Um, so this law should embolden whistleblowers. Everyone should want to step forward uh, thanks to this law. Let me add some important comment. Please. Father and public audience in sport, they uh, consider countries even across all countries. But if you take, if you take corruption perception index or freedom law, there are figures which shows which country is good and which is not good. And it covers 180 countries. If you take media, and you have another picture became more, not blurry. Uh, from top level, uh, from country, almost country, let's say New Zealand or Finland, United States, by the way, whistleblowers are mainly, I would say, anecdotal in Russia. It's a, it's a death grave threat. People are afraid. People need help. Remember the name, Andrei Dmitriev. He hardly escaped from Russia. Since 2017, we don't have any whistleblower from Russia. It shows how difficult and complicated you are. the problem is inside Russia. You are looking at athletes, like uh, uh, just athletes. But you know that Russian athletes, not athletes, they are police, army. Just one quick final note. Just wanted to say that this guy that's heading this up, this FBI agent, Joe Gillespie, He's heading this program, and he was the Eurasian crime squad guy responsible for Russian organized crime. So there is a really deep understanding at DOJ of what exactly what you're saying, Dr. Rochenkov. When Russia and their satellites, like, let's say, Belarusia or whatever, Uzbekistan, all this is, again, politics coming into sport. Now, when you hear from Russia politics, it means they are jeopardizing our criminal interests. It's an equal sign. Remember this forever. And again, don't trust to uh, Russia because the, I told many times that there are same words, cheating, lying, and denying. They are absolutely incorrigible. They never get along with them. If they agree with you, next day they close the door. Oh, stupid Americans. We are cheating him again. And forget about words. Law, government, president. It's a fiction and it's a farce. There is a dictator and his criminal protection environment and cheats who are stealing money, oil and gas from Russia and left 30% people of poverty. Dr. Rochenkov, I'd like for us to talk a bit about what this all means as we look forward to Tokyo specifically and Beijing and Winter Games 2022. That's not too far behind. So you very eloquently described the, the challenges for potential whistleblowers, for anyone who might want to shed light on doping systems in Russia, but also in, in any country that faces authoritarian regimes. What do you believe is the likely impact of the Rochenkov Anti-Doping Act, both in the short term and then in the longer term as well? It's a very good question and a very complicated question, maybe immediately and now that it's a game changer. Game changer means that those people who were part of conspiracy, they will tighten their security there because of fear. I know people who are core of a doping system. It's like a witch doctors or some others, uh, some other who enable athletes to do doping. They are very clever, they are very good. Now they have some sort of Damoclus sword above their heads. It's absolutely different uh, feelings and uh, style of life. You were not, you were untouchable and not vulnerable before. Now you are victim. Those people are victimized. And you should remember that I was victimized as a whistleblower uh, looking back in my shoulder. Now they are in the same situation. Sooner or later, 
they will be caught and punished. This is very important. Then again, people would like, oh, it's a success or very success to operate with some figures. We cannot say immediately, even with such nice men like Paul Gilles and Department of Justice, we see next month we will catch three groups of cheats. The deterrence means that three groups in other cheats in different cheating countries hardly would emerge. This is also very important. In the long run, I'm absolutely sure that they, it will be uh, removed and addressed and resolved any discrepancies between WADA and RADA. It's not a fight and uh, mutually exclusive things, not Russia versus uh, RADA versus WADA. It's WADA plus RADA. It's a synergy. But again, people should open their eyes, and as Gorbachev said, it's a new thinking. We need new thinking. And again, still, it's my thoughts. Uh, sport is full of people who are sitting in IOC WADA for 15 or 20 years. It cannot be like this. There should be rotation. We need a fresh blood. We should allow not only hurt athletes. Athletes should be sitting next to them and to control what they are saying. You know, I don't go step into details, but sport governing body, it's a stone age. It should be much more transparent, much more friendly, much more responsible because they are absolutely uh, uncontrolled. We see weightlifting. It should be RADA, it should be law enforcement, it should be a battalion to discover, uh, to undermine, to find all their frauds. It's a million of dollars. It's uh, hundreds of medals and world records, which are absolutely fake, I mean, uh, done by doping. Paul, are you optimistic that uh, things things will get into place to uh, to perpetrate cheaters between now and, uh, and Tokyo? When it comes to Tokyo 2021, we should expect doping fraud to go on. We got to be ready. I mean, at the end of the day, that's really what it, like Tokyo 2021 will be where the rubber hits the road of the Ruchenko effect. I am not so ignorant to believe it'll be the first clean Olympics, but is the first one where the Ruchenko anti-doping act will be in force, where doping fraud will be criminal. And it is incumbent now upon our executive branch, our enforcement apparatus to be ready. And when those whistleblowers come and they should have investigators ready, they should have a program ready. And when all that comes around, you know, Months after the competition, when we are inevitably getting the reports from journalists that so-and-so doped, and we're seeing all that, on the heels of that, we should be seeing indictments. And that's, that's the big difference. That's the, that'll be the first time ever in history that there has been real legal consequences for those in the structure, for those that actually you know, keep this doping apparatus alive uh, and, and are hollowing out international sport. We are starting to make the first steps in, in moving towards a, a time of cleaner sport, particularly eventually, and the Rotenkov Anti-Doping Act will make a significant difference in that respect. Gentlemen, I, I'd very much like to thank you both for appearing on Helsinki on the Hill. Dr. Rotenkov, thank you so much for not only appearing on the program today, but of course for sharing your extraordinarily courageous story with us and for being willing to come forward and expose this corruption. And Paul, thank you very much for, for helping us organize this conversation and for all the work you do in this field uh, for, for the members of the Health Thinking Commission. Listeners, you might want to find more information on the Rodchenkov Anti-Doping Act in particular. Paul, could you direct them to some resources? For sure. So there is a whole lot of stuff on csc.gov uh, that you can search and find. Um, the Bill, of course, is H.R. 835 uh, in the 116th Congress to see the actual text. And then, I mean, feel free to reach out to me personally. I'm always very excited to talk to everyone, anyone and everyone uh, about about this bill and, and, and anything else in the world of international anti-corruption policy. Thank you, Paul. Gentlemen, thank you very much both for your participation in this conversation. Listeners, as always, we welcome hearing from you uh, with feedback. Get in touch via our website, csc.gov, our Facebook page, or on Twitter. Thanks again for joining us. Until our next conversation, I'm Alex Tierski, signing off.